On today's episode, there is a new danger on the ISS, James Webb spots a frigid new world, and Stokes Space is almost ready to fly. The International Space Station has a big problem, and it's only getting worse. But what's weird about this situation is that NASA has acknowledged that there is both a high risk to people on board and a severe consequence for the station itself, yet they are telling the public very little about what is actually going on. What we do know is that the station has developed a new leak in the Russian segment, which is in addition to an existing leak that's been ongoing for the past five years, one that NASA claimed had been repaired, or at least the Russians said they fixed it, but it turns out the ISS is still losing air. And that loss of air is concerning enough to the American Space Agency that they have delayed the launch of a crewed mission aboard the SpaceX Dragon capsule this month. The commercial company Axiom Space was set to launch their fourth round of private astronauts on a space tourism expedition to the ISS on June 12th, but the launch was called off. In a statement released several days later, NASA writes that they, quote, delayed the mission as the agency continued to work with Roscosmos to understand the most recent repair efforts to seal small leaks. In their own statement, the Russian space agency claimed that the air leak in the Sviezda module has been completely sealed after the last repair work in June 2025. And yet, according to an independent report from Eric Berger at Ars Technica, who has a network of sources within NASA that have proven to be credible many times in the past, he writes that the overall air pressure in the space station at large has continued to drop. So the air has to be going somewhere. And here is the area for concern. It's called the PRK module. It's kind of like a docking tunnel that connects the primary Russian module, Sviezda, with the Russian Progress spacecraft, which is used for resupply missions. But the Progress thruster system is also frequently used to push the space station up to maintain its orbit, often referred to as a reboost. Cracks in the PRK began to emerge as early as 2019, and they've gotten progressively worse since then. In February 2024, NASA identified an increase in the leak rate from less than one pound of atmosphere a day to 2.4 pounds a day. And by April of the same year, the rate increased to 3.7 pounds a day. In the six years of dealing with this situation, neither Russian nor US officials have been able to identify the underlying cause of the leak. Or if they have, they're just not telling us. Now, back to the Russian claim that they fixed the problem. We know that from time to time, Russian cosmonauts have experimented with repairs to the small cracks, but they have generally only slowed the progression of the leak. At some point, they decided to just keep the door between Zviezda and PRK closed, and that seemed to work well enough. Now, the Russians have declared the problem to be solved, and they back that up with evidence that air pressure inside the PRK module has stabilized, a claim which NASA also endorsed. Except the station continues to leak, and no one seems to know why. But there is a theory that has been reported by Eric Berger. He writes, The best guess is that the seals on the hatch leading to the PRK module are in some way leaking. In this scenario, pressure from the station is feeding the leak inside the PRK module through these seals leading to a stable pressure inside, making it appear as though the PRK module leaks are fully repaired. Which basically means that the Russians didn't fix anything, and in fact, their door is now also broken, which is what made it appear like things had gotten better, when in reality, they are now even worse. Allegedly. And while this is not a catastrophic problem right now, NASA claims they are treating it as the highest level of threat. NASA uses a 5x5 risk matrix. Basically, you have a square grid with five blocks on each axis, one side indicates the likelihood that a problem will occur, and the other side indicates the consequence of that problem to the station as a whole. NASA considers the existing leak to be a 5 in both categories. So what is the consequence that they're worried about? Well, Eric Berger identifies a worst-case scenario known as high cycle fatigue, which affects metal, including aluminum, which is what the ISS modules are made of. Think about what happens when you bend a metal clothes hanger. It's easy to bend once, maybe twice, but if you bend it back and forth multiple times, it will snap. This is because as the metal fatigues, it hardens and eventually fails. This happens suddenly and without warning. 
The ISS is now five years over its originally intended lifespan. When the station began operation in 2001, it was only intended for use up to the year 2020. We don't exactly have a long history of space stations to draw on, but the first permanent modular station, the Soviet Mir, only really lasted for about a decade before it degraded and was ultimately abandoned and allowed to fall back down to Earth. ISS is largely based on the same design. Actually, the Russian module Zvezda was originally constructed as a backup for Mir in the late 1980s. So it's old, but the rest of the station isn't much younger. It wasn't that long ago that Elon Musk made a claim the ISS had already reached the end of its useful life space and should be retired as soon as possible. NASA has already acknowledged that their activity in space will need to be reduced in the near future to absorb deep funding cuts that will come with the next US budget for 2026. The agency has also been without real leadership for the past six months, and that shows no sign of changing anytime soon. We are in a rough patch for sure, but not all NASA projects have the same problems, and the James Webb Space Telescope has been seeing some incredible success while being operated by a small research team. This week, James Webb photographed an incredibly distant planet that could be one of the oldest ever discovered. This was particularly impressive because the planet known as 14 Hercules C is incredibly cold, which makes it equally faint and difficult to pick out among the many dots in the sky. Normally, a planet of this nature would be drastically outshined by its star, which in this case is very similar to our own star. Most exoplanets that have been captured with telescopes, especially ones as far away as Hercules, which sits about 60 light years from Earth, are large, bright, gaseous planets. This one, however, is incredibly cold with an average temperature around negative 3 degrees Celsius, which normally would make it impossible to see. However, the planet's unusual orbit causes it to gain just the right angle for James Webb to capture it. The planet doesn't orbit on a flat plane, it's slightly tilted, making an X-shaped orbit with its neighbor planet 14 Hercules b. This means that at one point in its orbit, Hercules c passes slightly higher than its star and the light no longer blocks it out. This was when James Webb was able to use its gigantic mirror to capture the planet in this picture, showing it as a faint orange dot next to its host star. The inclination of Hercules C is about 40 degrees, which is 33 degrees higher than any planet in our solar system, and also extremely high in most other terms. It's unclear what put this planet in such a high orbit. The lead astronomer in the project, William Balmer, thinks there may have been another planet involved. His hypothesis is that a third body once existed in the solar system, but it was thrown off from the star, pulling both 14 Hercules b and c out further along with it skewing their orbits. He summed it up as the two planets now fighting in a sort of planetary tug of war. The planet was also incredibly interesting for its atmospheric properties. Bomber's team was able to decipher the contents of 14 Hercules C's atmosphere using that single picture captured on Webb's near-infrared camera. One of the most interesting aspects of the study was the presence of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which has never been photographed on an exoplanet before. Bomber's team believes that powerful atmospheric currents on Hercules C are rapidly transporting molecules formed in the warmer, deeper layers of the atmosphere to the colder, upper layers. This would indicate a very active atmosphere, essentially churning the air in violent currents. This would likely make it a very cold yet stormy planet, however, further studies will be needed to reveal its true nature. Only five years ago, a study such as this would never be possible. However, with the addition of James Webb, we can now reveal more about our own galaxy rather than just the other seven planets in our own solar system. Not all space advancements are happening so far away, with some of the most important not even making it off the ground yet, but they are getting incredibly close. The relatively new company known as Stoke Space has just given an update on its progress to build a fully reusable competitor to the SpaceX Starship. Stoke showed off this video in February, revealing that work on their new engine is almost complete, and now it seems to be ready. This will power the second stage of their medium lift rocket known as Nova and is the most complex part of the entire system. Because Stoke wants Nova to basically imitate Starship, their first stage had to be reusable as well. However, the way SpaceX chose to develop Starship's recovery system with the giant tower and the chopstick arms make it overly complicated, especially for something as small as Nova. 
That's why Stoke has developed their own heat shield and engine for the rocket, which works hand in hand. The engine, named Andromeda after our closest galactic neighbor, has 24 combustion chambers which circle the outside of the round bottom vehicle. These are technically one engine, yet each thruster can be controlled individually to increase the thrust differential on either side, allowing Nova's upper stage to turn. This is essential since the vehicle has to make it into space straight up and return to the surface of Earth straight up as well. In order to do this, the upper stage heat shield is located on its dome aft section and is completely bare stainless steel. If you've watched any of Starship's flights, you know that any uncovered steel immediately melts on re-entry. It does not matter how big or small. And this is where Stokes' active heat shield comes in. The propellant lines in a rocket would normally just flow straight to the engine, but instead these take a detour and flow directly through Nova's heat shield. Since the liquid hydrogen the rocket burns on is chilled to around negative 253 degrees Celsius, the stainless steel it passes over is also chilled, and in turn is much better equipped to handle the extreme heat of re-entry. Stoke recently revealed the engine's testing progress in an X-Post, showing the sharp contrast between their hot firings out of a shipping container in 2020 and in 2025 with a fully integrated test at their own facility. They revealed that Andromeda had been tested and adjusted to what Stoke believes is its final form and will likely be full flight hardware. This would put them on track to launch this year, and they want to do that not once but twice in 2025. They might seem quite far from completion, however Stoke has a track record of developing and building new hardware incredibly fast as they tend to build more and test less. This is known as a hardware-rich design and is exactly how SpaceX developed Starship so quickly. Stoke might just be the only company to move faster than SpaceX as they only announced Nova in late 2023 and already have fully functioning hardware and a flight date. The two-stage rocket could change how we look at spaceflight altogether by bringing a simplified approach to full reusability, which is essential to bringing down costs for smaller companies.